cannot let our circumstances shape the way we view our God. We must let our God shape the way we view our circumstances. You see, there are things in life that are unavoidable, unpredictable, and uncomfortable that come into our lives that are totally outside Knowing of about control. Jesus, being able to articulate the stories, being able to, to recount the gospel, being able to know some Bible verses is not the same thing as surrendering the control of your life to the Lordship Consider of Jesus Christ. Consider it all joy. The faith that you have, that's what's going to define you. Now, I wouldn't say I'm an angry person, but angry situations tend to follow me around. In fact, I think it was only the last time I was up here that I talked about being a victim of road rage. And it seems like every time I drive, I'm a victim of road rage, which has caused me to have some internal dialogue with myself and think, Jeff, maybe you're the problem. But then I realized that's ridiculous. Of course it's not me. But I wanted to tell you another story about me on the road. I am honestly not a bad driver, but it just seems like chaos follows me everywhere. Have you ever seen somebody truly lose their mind? Like there's something about TikTok videos that I can just get sucked into the vortex at 3 a.m. of those Karen angry, let me talk to your manager videos of people just throwing absolute fits in public and your spine is tingling because you're embarrassed for them. It makes Michael Scott from the office look like he's just chill and socially adequate. It makes me cringe. And I'll be honest with you, I love cringe. It's the best form of entertainment. It's just, I can't get enough of it. Maybe that says something about me. But have you ever seen someone lose it? Like an adult temper tantrum. A couple months ago, I was driving along, and I honestly don't know what I did. I might have, maybe I made a lane change a little too quick, a little too hard. Maybe I didn't signal. I think I always signal, but maybe we didn't. You know, I don't drive a BMW. I do signal. All the BMW people are like, nah, 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 nah. and everyone else is like, preach! We've all been there! Just saying. But I don't know what this problem was that this guy had, but all of a sudden someone's swerving behind me. You know when you start seeing somebody swerving, they're flashing their high beams at you. It's like two in the afternoon, man. Like, doesn't really do that much to me. But pulling up, revving his engines up, he's pulling up beside me. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I forgot about him for a while. Like, whatever, whatever. Maybe he just wants to pass, and he's just a little eager. Pull up to the red light, and he pulls up beside me. And you know you get that death glare from somebody like, usually followed by several different hand gestures or mouthing words. And I was like, okay, well, like, whatever. I don't care. Like, this is weird. You're kind of like, I don't really, I don't want to. Don't want to look at him. Maybe if I just turn up the radio, he'll go away. Then you pull up to the next light, and you're kind of like, okay, whatever. And all of a sudden, whips out in front of you. Same thing. Ah, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder, whatever. Okay, I'm like, well, a little louder. <laughs> okay. Still there. Okay. Next light comes up again. And now I'm getting a little irked, right? Like, enough is enough, buddy. Enough. I may be driving a small truck, but I am a big man, and I'm not saying anything by that, but watch yourself. But of course I'm a pastor, and of course I'm a good person, so I wouldn't throw hands on the street. I don't want to end up on YG Wave or something like that. You know, you're all just out there on a Sunday afternoon, and Pastor Jeff's just chucking knucks with some guy in a... Dodge Ram with a monster energy drink hat. Wouldn't perform well at the next yearly review on staff. But there are ways. And I don't know if this is right, but my response instead of, you know, returning threats of violence, because honestly I can't do that, is just to love him back. So I looked over at him and I blew him a kiss. <laughs> And I don't know what it is. This guy is scared of love because he just started to lose his mind. He's foaming at the mouth and he started giving all the hand gestures and he's threatening and he's saying he's going to kill me. And I thought, man, this guy, 
is scared of love. I need to love him harder and more. And so, like, you just need to just extend more to him to bring. And I just looked at him and I said, I hurt. <laughs> but he kind of calmed down after I blew him a kiss because any man can threaten another man's life. You ain't going to kill me. That's like a 1.001% chance. But a man who's weird, you don't know what he's up to. And he quickly just kind of like, so let me tell you, I don't necessarily know if that was the right thing to do, but it was better than fighting. So I think I have a net positive in that. But this guy was losing it. Like, sure, sometimes someone nearly, literally someone almost hit me on the way to the project tonight. Like, just swerved into me. We're all at an elevated state driving. You know, we're already, like, aware that we're in a steel bullet going 100 kilometers an hour, and we could die at any moment if, like, a pothole is in the wrong spot, or there's, like, a like a nail in the wrong spot in the road, or you hit a porcupine, true story, that can happen and blow out your tire. Could happen. I was mad, but this guy was losing it. And I want to ask you this. Have you ever really truly lost your mind, lost it. How do you deal with conflict? How do you react when other people make you mad? Well, take a look in James again. We're going through the series Hard Knock Life, and we're going to take a look at James 4. We'll start right out with it, James 4, 1. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you spend what you get on your pleasures. James is saying that conflict within is where our weakness comes from, that our conflict comes from the weakness we have inside. When we're insecure about ourselves and our lives, Instead of looking to ourselves and to fix what makes us uncomfortable with ourselves, we look to others. We don't look internally, we look look externally. We take on the root of blaming other people for the problems in our lives or, or just looking at other people as a distraction for what's happening. If we look at their problems, we look at what they do, then we don't have to acknowledge kind of that we're not that great to distract from ourselves the parts of our lives, our character and our heart and our soul that we know isn't where it should be. Have you ever been there? If you really are honest with yourself, are you ever in that space where you're mad at someone else, but in reality, maybe you're just unhappy with yourself? Because we end up running up the down escalator as human beings. We sprint on this hamster wheel trying to get everything we want all at once. We're trying to find happiness in everything that we can. We're trying to always be in this relentless, endless, never achieving it pursuit of being truly happy. Trying to fill a hole in our lives with more stuff, more sex, more fun, better education, better posture, better, better position in a company or in our social circles. We're trying to fill these gaps with something, but we never quite reach that finish line. And frankly, it's exhausting. And I think we all can admit that we've been there at some point. I know I have. And not just like when I was 20. That's a temptation that we all have is to fill the voids in our life with the wrong things, thinking that, you know, it doesn't quite fit in the slot, but at least it's something. Maybe this is the thing. Maybe this is the thing that I can try. Maybe this is the experience or or the, the relationship that is going to fix my sadness. But we just chase and chase and chase, and we're just exhausted. James goes on to explain that the root of our disdain, it comes from our relationship with the world around us. We're kind of in this point and this posture of pain and anger and frustration because we are so desperately having this relationship and chasing the world around us. Our distraction from God comes from our friendship with the world. So maybe you're kind of asking here, you're like, okay, Jeff, like you're saying, you're trying to tell me that if I enjoy the world I live in, that I live in, I literally exist in, I'm ruining my life, and I'm sinning. Good luck with that. How can that work? I I can't win in that situation. I literally, that's like saying, go swim in the ocean, but don't get wet. Come on. Not possible. Truth is, you live in the world. Can't escape that. That's not a problem. The world we live in is a beautiful place. People, 
social experience, family, friends, relationships, even sex in the right space and in the right position is good. But James isn't telling us that we need to sell all of our world possessions, our worldly possessions, put on long skirts and itchy old-fashioned slacks, move into the woods, and only listen to Christian music and watch Christian movies. That's not the solution. Sounds really weird, actually. That's a really weird cult. The word, the truth is this. He wants us And he's trying to get us to take a look at what is the most important relationship in our lives. So let's take a look at the word that he uses, friendship. The word friendship here comes from the Greek word philia. If you've ever heard of like Philadelphia, that's a similar, it's from the root of philia. Which doesn't mean existing in the world when he's talking about having a friendship with the world. It's actually creating a deep and loyal bond with the things of this world with the options that are available to us that culture offers us, with the things that culture and sin give us and that the world says is good for us to become accustomed to a pattern of casual interactions with what is bad for us rather than beyond casually, beyond deeply having a relationship with the God who created us, with Jesus who died for us and a loyalty to the world and to the patterns of the external things that are not what God would call us to as opposed to Jesus, who we're called to emulate in everything that we do, who died for us, who is the hope of the world, who gives us new life, and that's one of the things we're celebrating. It's really the thing we're celebrating tonight with baptism. Where we get to the point in our, our lies, our selfishness, our pride, our sexual sin, they become closer friends to us than God is. And nobody who calls themselves a Christian, and I think there's a few of us here tonight, would ever just come out and say, yeah, I'm a better friend with sin than I am with Jesus. The old Christian song, I'm a friend of God. No one's like, I am a friend of sin. Like, it's just not fun. It doesn't really land well on a Sunday morning. But the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, we've all been in seasons, and maybe you're there right now, where we've been closer friends with the world, closer friends with sin, closer friends with our addiction, closer friends with our pain and the untruths that we believe about ourselves and our identity than we are friends with God. We're closer to those negative things. We have a loyal bond to them. We've allowed that to become a casual interaction, and we've missed out on the deepest, greatest friendship that anyone can ever have, and that's with the God who created you, with Jesus who died on the cross, with the Holy Spirit who wants to live within you and guide you through every hardship, every good moment, who wants to be that presence in your life to help you through everything. And I'm not here to tell you that if that's you today, that get out. You're not welcome here. God's done with you. Because the truth is that it's completely the opposite. We're all there. Maybe to different degrees and different levels, but we're all there. The person beside you, behind you, in front of you, and across from you, we all are broken and we all need Jesus and we all have times where we choose friendship with the world and with culture and with sin over our friendship with Jesus. I want to take a look at Proverbs because it really nails down what we're talking about. In Proverbs 18, 24, it says, one who has unreliable friends soon, soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that's the thing. Culture promises us all these things, money, success, sex, happiness, whatever it is. But the truth is the world is a bad friend. Don't get caught up in in the literal word, the world. Culture, temptation, things that are not good for us, they are a bad friend. They're like that friend that takes you out partying, but you just wake up hungover every time. And they go too hard and you can't keep up. And you just find yourself in this pattern of bad. It is a bad influence. That's the friend that your parents didn't want you hanging out with when you were in elementary school. It's not a good friend. But God, who is closer than a brother in that relationship, closer than family, closer than the tightest bond you can imagine in your life, he promises us if we pattern our lives after Jesus and we become loyal friends of him, with him, the God of the universe who died on the cross and rose again three days later so that we could be connected to God and we could be forgiven of the sins that we can't make up for on our own, 
That is the friendship that will change your life and will sustain you and keep you happy and content. Even if you're not happy, you will be content. You will have everything you need and you won't have to chase after all these different things. A friendship with Jesus makes us look like the, or sorry, a friendship with Jesus makes us different than the relationship with the broken world around us. We look more like Christ within us than we look like the broken world around us. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble, James says as well. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So how does this fit into having a road rage incident? Kind of seems like a backwards way. The truth is when we align with the world, we align with the pride and ego that drives us towards sin. And that is sin. But when we align with Jesus, we align with humility. Patterns of ego and patterns of pride will lead us into situations and relationships that are governed by pride and by ego. When we align with Jesus and we pattern our life with him and what he's called us to, our relationships and the way that we conduct ourselves will fall into line with that same humility that Jesus had. And this is modeled for us in the book of Philippians in chapter two, verses three to five, where it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Humility aligns with Jesus. Ego aligns with this algorithmic trap that the world gives us to fall to our lowest common denominator, and it will steal everything from you. It will feel good. It's like just buying everything that comes onto your sponsored posts on Instagram. Eventually, you're going to be broke and have a lot of useless crap. That will be your life. You would never do that because it's preposterous. It's the dumbest thing you could do. It's the most self-destructive thing you can, one of them that you can think of. But if you chase after everything that the algorithm of life is offering you, you'll find yourself in a worse situation than that ridiculous idea. But if you align yourself with the humility and the pattern and the love and the peace and the patience that Jesus calls us to and that he showed, you will find yourself at peace. You will find that humility you're looking for. It says at the end of that verse in Philippians that we must have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus was the embodiment of humility. He was literally God and he humbled himself to the point where he lived like a poor person's life. He didn't just live as a human with all the the, the pain and the awkwardness of a human childhood and life. He actually was born into a family that was on the wrong side of the tracks in a fairly impoverished area. He even would have sounded his, his dialect, his voice, even within his community, he would have been known as poor and socially lesser than. He humbled himself where he should have been on a throne, he should have been carried around by his servants and been, had people feeding grapes into his mouth and palm leaves just Make him cool, I guess. That's why they do that, cooling him down. But no, he lived this human life. He, he experienced pain and eventually experienced torture and death on a cross, the most humiliating death that you can ever imagine because he was humble. And he is the gold standard of how we live our lives. And we live out our lives by that standard. Everything gets better, including our relationships with our family, with our friends, with our church community, with our coworkers, They all get better when we follow our lives and when we live out the same mindset and posture that we choose to live like that Jesus did. So let me ask you this. Are you aligned with Jesus? When something happens, do you fly off the handle? Do you turn on other people? Do you get mad? Or do you look for the best You try and find the common ground. You see maybe, why are they thinking like that? What happened in their childhood? What could have happened recently? What are they going through? Often we're just like, that person's acting out. It's like a kid. When I was a kid, I thought every kid that was misbehaving was just a bad kid. You know the term bad kid? I've learned more and more working with kids from at-risk situations and vulnerable sector that there are, listen, there are kids that behave bad. Let's not kid ourselves here. We've all seen that. My gosh. But there is no such thing, in my opinion, as a bad kid. Because you look back at some of the kids that when you went to elementary school and you start to think through, oh, I remember there was something 
that their parents were going through. Or that kid was abused. Or that kid came from a broken home. There's always a reason. It's not an excuse, but there's always a reason why people believe and act the way that they do, for better or for worse. And maybe they just weren't dealt the same hand you were in life. And that doesn't mean you should feel shame or guilt for the opportunities that you've had or for how things have worked out financially, socially, economically, whatever. But humility says, what is happening? Not what are they doing? And that's what Jesus would do. He didn't fly off the handle. He hung out with prostitutes and thieves and tax collectors. He didn't define them by what they did. He defined them by who they are. He defined them by who they could be how God saw them, their potential. He had compassion on them. And we're called to emulate Jesus, to reflect Jesus in everything we do. So let me ask you, do you? Or do you let the weight of social circumstances of the garbage you see on TikTok, TikTok dictate how you respond? The news you know, the conversations at your school and your workplace, maybe the legitimate poor things, the awful things that were done against you by people in the past or recently. How do you see people? With humility or with war? And we see this in our world, right? Like, there's so much anger. It's, they literally have studies showing that Facebook and TikTok and all of these social media, and I'm not just here to pick on social media, I love it too, but it is aimed at you. It is aimed at you like a target between your eyes to tick you off, to share the thing that you are going to get the most enraged by because then you'll stay engaged, you'll stay mad, you'll look for more, and it becomes recreational anger. We see this in culture, but the truth is this, if we're talking politics, if we really look at it, I don't think we're all that different. If you're a far right-wing person, if you're a right-wing po political follower or you're a left-wing political follower, we disagree greatly. That's really the culture shift that we have. But we're looking at the world around us and we're actually looking at the same problems and probably agreeing on the same problems. We might see helping people that are in bad financial situations or impoverished. We both would say, that's bad. Hey, actually, you just agreed on something. We can shake hands on that. We need to get to a point where that's not a problem anymore. Okay, cool. Wait, do we agree? Did we just become best friends? Yeah. Maybe not. But we see the same starting point. We see the same ending point. And then what do we do? We start articulating how to get there. And then we decide that the other person is evil because they want to take Highway 2 and I want to take Highway 2A. Which are both broken. Because they're made by humans. And we decide, I, I, it's good, my road's better. No, my road's better. <laughs> we fight. We're both wrong. And we hate. And that's just in culture. We see people in our own lives who hurt us. And listen, I know there's hurt. I've been hurt. I'm not here to tell you you haven't been. But whether it's a huge betrayal or whether it's just a little slight, we just see people that act differently than we would like them to. We actually define them as an enemy. Somebody to go to war with. Somebody that is broken and irredeemable and not worth our time. And then we decide they're bad. We're so desperate to avoid our own failures that we just zero in on theirs. Because if we don't have to look in the mirror, if we focus our sights over at the person that hurt us, we don't have to see the blemishes in our own lives. In Matthew 7, 3 to 5, Jesus talks about this when he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What Jesus is saying, check yourself before you wreck yourself. You're not that good. And that's okay, because you're not defined by what you do. You are defined by Jesus who lives within you, who can help us to not just change our behavior, but change our heart and our soul with his forgiveness. And as we pattern our life after him, we'll find the peace that we're looking for, and we won't be defined by those things anymore. 
But we have to stop looking at the little piece of sawdust in the friend's eye, in our family member's eye, the person or the political group or the people, whatever, that we see and we're mad at and say, well, look at how they are. When we've got a literal tree sticking out of our cranium. It's, it sounds like an over-exaggeration, but that's truly what we do. I do it. My life could be falling apart, but at least I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that, that guy, but unfortunately I'm like me. And if I don't recognize that, if I don't go to Christ with that, if I don't go to Jesus with that and try to work on that and refine it, I'm never going to get better, and I, then I can't help anyone else to be better. If you don't take care of yourself first, you'll never change the world. You won't even change your own family, your own friend group. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. If we spend our whole lives fighting, we'll never find peace. Locally, interpersonally, nationally, globally, but most importantly, in our hearts and in the church. And I want to talk church. If you've never been before, I'm thankful you're here. You're welcome here. But the truth is this, and I've been a part of it in my life, so I'm here with you. There's so much fighting in church. I'm not talking about just the project or Hope City. I'm talking big C church. There's so many different perspectives, and I think that's what part of what makes be- the church beautiful. If we can agree that Jesus is God, and that sin is sin, and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and that we go to heaven and we have connection back to God through that, there's not much more that matters other than primary theology. But beyond just secondary theology, we move into politics, we move into opinions, and there's so many different things that we tend to just get riled up about, and we fight each other, and it turns into like a form of like civil war. Yeah, we worship Jesus together, but I disagree on the vaccine policy. Remember that? Or maybe it's Israel and Palestine, or maybe it's tattoos or no tattoos. Tattoos. (laughs) She shouldn't dress like that. Do you know how many girls he's been with? We judge everyone else. We look at the speck in their eye, but we turn it into this massive thing. And we define people within our church, Christian community with it. Political issues, personal vendettas, whatever it is, we find a way to choose conflict in our 2024 church. And that's not what we're called to. That's not the standard we're called to. You want to know what the standard we're called to is? Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. He said, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others and they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. You, t- you don't have your own light, but we reflect the light that Jesus shines. We are a reflection of Jesus. We need to be that to people, and it starts at home. We can't go out into the world and show a different way to live if we're not living like it within our church family. We can't expect to be humble out there if we're not humble in here first. If we're aligned with the world and we're just dis- content and discomfort with what, the way we're living and what we're chasing, we're never going to find the humility to be like Jesus. And we'll never change the world. If we don't change our own lives, we're useless to anyone else. And it starts here. It starts at home, whether that's your perception of the church, people in the church, other, celebrity pastors, other pastors, whatever your thing is, the other people in your small group. And I'm not saying this because I've seen this. This isn't like a, a, a thing for the project. I'm so thankful that the project actually has been quite a place of just being content and community. But I see this across the board in church culture, and I just think it needs to be addressed. We can't cover the light because that light is too important to hide. We need to shine it on the world and show there is a different way to live. There is a better way to live in your workplace, at your school, at your family dinner with your crazy conservative uncle or your super liberal cousin who are just fighting to show that there is a way to love each other. We're called to be a countercultural way to live, to be a standard that is different and shows that there is a better way. John 13, 35 says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. They'll know you're my followers, Christians, by how you love one another. 
He'll shine the light into the world and invite them into a loyal friendship with Jesus that is so much more fulfilling than anything that the world offers. Not by listening to more Christian music, though that's fine, or watching Christian movies, fine. Not even having a Bible verse in the caption of your Instagram photo under an overpass picture looking mysterious. I'm not calling anyone out specifically, but if that's you, be better. <laughs> Civil war hides our lamp under a bowl. And we miss out on not just sharing Jesus, but we miss out on the friendship. We miss out on the fullness of that friendship that Jesus offers up, that relationship with the God that created us. By how you love, and of course this is not just with people in the church. We need to love everyone. But if we can't do it at home, we're a bad example. When we see on TikTok, on the news, Christians bickering with each other over little things or even big things, but we don't deal with it internally. We don't go to each other directly. We just kind of complain and call them out, say what I just did, be better, as if we're any better. What a bad example. Who wants to come to that? Who wants to be a part of that community? Because it's exactly the same as the world around us. The darkness that we see on social media, the darkness we see in war. If there's more war inside the walls of the church, no one's going to want to come in. It doesn't matter how cool of an event you invite them to, how, how the experience is. It's community that really builds the church. Community surrounding Jesus and what, what he's called us to be. So let me ask you this tonight. Before we call out people to be baptized and, and dunked and celebrate, I want to ask you this. Three things. And this is three ways that you can find unity in the church and unity with your world around you and to align with what Jesus has called to us with humility as opposed to what the world has called to us with ego. First one is, is there unresolved conflict in my life? Especially in the big C global church. Past church hurt, suffering, pain you've been through. I'm not saying that that wasn't real and that that wasn't bad and that I'm sorry that happened, but is there unresolved conflict? In a Jesus-based life, unresolved conflict becomes bitterness. It doesn't hurt the person to hurt you. It'll rot you. What do you need to give to God right now? You can't hold on to it any longer. Ask yourself, number two, am I better friends with culture than I am with Jesus? Is the pattern of your life, are you a loyal friend to sin and to the patterns of that more than you are to Jesus within you? Do you look more like the world outside than you do like Jesus within you? Do you need to start processing that, working through that? It starts with being honest with God and saying, Holy Spirit, just come in and check me. Expose the things. Don't make me feel guilt. Let me tell you this. God doesn't deal in guilt, but he will convict you of your sin. He will make you discomfortable, uncomfortable with what you've been doing that is not in alignment with them. And you won't be able to help but to take steps in that direction. And maybe you need to bring people in, talk to a pastor, talk to a friend, get accountability. But do not wait to align yourself with Jesus. To seek him as your number one friendship. Number three is what pride and insecurity in my life. And we all have one. Do I need to give to God to walk humbly with him? Is it your money? Is it your looks? Is it that you can't seem to get a boyfriend or girlfriend, that marriage seems out of hand, that you just keep getting hurt over and over again? You're not that smart. You failed in school. Your job sucks. You went to four years of education, and you're like, I hate being a teacher. What did I do? I've seen all these things. What is the thing that is insecurity that is making you uncomfortable, but you're not addressing what that is and taking it to God or the sin in your life, and you're going off and just deciding that there's something else, there's conflict, let's distract ourselves. What is the thing that you've been hiding from that you just need to take to Jesus and allow his Holy Spirit to work in your heart and to refine you and show you who you really are, which is enough beautiful and someone who should be content in who you've been designed to be, a child of God. That's who you are. You're so much more than the conflict you've sought. You're so much more than what the world offers you. There is a friendship, and maybe you've never heard this before, that will change your life. It has changed my life, and it has carried me through the good times of my life and the seasons of hell that I've experienced. 
that will sustain you through the hardest seasons and that will be something that makes the celebration of the good times so much better. If you don't have Jesus in your life, I'll say this, you're missing out, but more importantly, you need it. You need Jesus. You need Jesus to come into your heart and to change your life and to bring the hope where there's been hopelessness and to bring light where there's been darkness. You need Jesus. I'm not going to apologize for it. You need him. So don't miss out. Don't miss out on the life that you were designed for. Don't miss out on what really matters. And don't miss out on the most purposeful, valuable experience, what we were meant to experience here on earth, and that's life with Jesus. And all you have to do is invite him into your heart. Pattern your life after him, and that's a process of making yourself look more like Jesus over time, being a disciple or a follower, but it starts with the decision. And if that's you today, I want to invite you to make that decision right now. And all it takes is for you to pray this along in your heart with me. If that's you, let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross. Thank you that you are God. Thank you that we're not defined by our sins, that I'm not defined by my sins, but I'm defined by the forgiveness that you give. Thank you that you rose again, that you defeated death. You can defeat anything, the sickness, the addiction, the brokenness that I can't seem to outrun, the conflict that I just keep seeking out everywhere. Jesus, I, I know that you can beat that and I give you my life because of that. So I pray that I would look every day more like you than I did the day before and you would help me to speak, to think, and to act more like you. Thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.